the world does not need another cellist. Mm -hmm. So if I'm to actually have a job as a cellist, you know, I'm not a fireman. You know, it's like we need a fireman. We need a doctor. But if I'm to actually be a valued person practicing something that I think I love and and that I'd like to do more of, then I need to find its value. One of the lessons I've learned in martial arts is that standing still is asking to be hit. If you stand still in business, your competition is gonna catch up. I start each morning practicing martial arts because it brings me balance and focus. And I wanna know how others stay motivated as well. So join me for conversations on business, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I'm Dan Schulman. Welcome to Never Stand Still. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Schulman, the president and CEO of PayPal. And welcome to another episode of Never Stand Still. Today, I'm so pleased to have my good friend Yo-Yo Ma join us. Um, Yo-Yo needs no introduction. Everybody knows him. But I found out so many interesting facts, Yo-Yo, about you when I was researching this that I've got to say a couple of them. Like, I'll start off with a fact that probably very few people know, that Yo-Yo does have a nickname for his cello. It's Petunia. Uh, Petunia, I think, was crafted in 1733. And Yo-Yo once left Petunia in the backseat of a New York City taxi cab accidentally. Uh, luckily recovered. Luckily recovered. Yo-Yo is obviously a world famous cellist, but he is a, also a world famous humanitarian. And he is a outspoken advocate for human rights and racial justice. He has produced over 100 albums and he has performed with everybody, you know, some of the um, uh, artists that he's performed with that many people on our show will be familiar with, Carlos Santana, Sting, uh, his neighbor in the Berkshires, James Taylor, and a good friend of both of ours, Emmanuel Axe, uh, Manny, who uh, Yo-Yo has known for such a long time. He also has 19 Grammys. And no pun intended, that's got to be a record of, uh, of some sort, uh, Yo-Yo. So it's just unbelievable. And I want to give a little bit of history on Yo-Yo because it's so interesting and fascinating. And I'm going to go and talk about Yo-Yo and what he did before he was 10 years old. OK, so he was born in 1955. And I think somewhere around the age of two or three, he was playing four different instruments, the violin, the piano, the viola, and the cello. Now, unlike most of us, at the age of four, Yo-Yo made the decision that he was going to focus on the cello. I was still trying to decide between like where hot dogs or hamburgers, my favorite food, and, you know, throwing a temper tantrum if I didn't get them. Yo-Yo decided to focus in on the cello. And thank goodness he did that. Uh, at the age of five, he was performing in front of live audiences. And then at the age of seven, I didn't know this, uh, Yo Yo, you performed in front of two presidents, Dwight D. Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy, which must have been unbelievable. But that was at the age of seven. At the age of eight, he did his first TV performance. Um, in a concert conducted by Leonard Bernstein, of all people. And then at the age of nine, I believe you and your sister went on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. All of that before 10 years old. Um, and then obviously there has been so much uh, after that and so many accolades and awards, Yo-Yo, that uh, you have so deservedly uh, been, uh, been appointed uh, Kofi Annan uh, appointed Yo-Yo the UN Peace Ambassador. He's received the National Medal of Arts. Uh, he's got a doctorate of music from Oxford and Princeton, honorary degrees from Harvard and Dartmouth. 
uh, all schools that rejected me. Um, he also uh, is, that's true, by the way, uh, he is a commander of the Order of Arts and Letters, I believe uh, given to you by, uh, by France. And President Obama awarded Yo-Yo the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor than any citizen in the United States uh, can receive. Um, despite all of that, Yo-Yo is probably one of the most humble and self-effacing people that I've ever met. One of the very nicest and most generous souls um, that you will come across. And uh, Yo-Yo, it's so nice to see you and welcome to the show. Dan, it's so great to see you. And uh, Dan and I are actually um, neighbors in a small town in, in Massachusetts, and he has the most wonderful family. And I'm so happy to actually meet you in this context because your world is is a very big world. And, um, and I have to say that I was reading about what PayPal does, and especially after Black Lives Matter, and I am so incredibly impressed. It's maybe the best, uh, best description of what a company is willing to do on the short term, mid term, and long term. That's, I think, thinking in that way is, uh, I find really unusual. Uh, and I would love to have a chance to talk to you about some of this because that's something I know that I'm obviously looking at my privileges and what that means in terms of, you know, how I can best use whatever platform I might have uh, to serve those in need. And, and I think, but you do it, it within a business context, which is totally remarkable. And um, and I think this is a, a going to be a really interesting conversation for me to learn how you negotiate, how you navigate all of these things with the pressures of actually, you know, of, of wanting to make sure that they're, you're generating also profit for the company and and for your investors, but also for the multi-stakeholders of in our society. So yeah. that's that's something I wrestle with all the time, and I believe that's something that you've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about, and and probably many of your listeners are also thinking about. Yeah, well, I look forward to talking to you about that because I think uh, leaders in the business community and leaders in the arts. Both, I think, have an obligation in this time to step up to address the issues. Um, and there are so many issues that uh, uh, that we face because, you know, we do live um, in very strange times right now. COVID-19, besides being a, a health crisis, you know, uh, immediately cascaded into an economic crisis, right. which you know, put into stark relief a lot of issues that were already evident uh, in our country before COVID-19 happened. And then that unleashed sort of a psychological crisis. You know, something like 75 percent of people throughout the world are very um, stressed about what's happening, uh, the state of the world, the state of the economy, the state of uh, democracies, the state of what's happening with social justice. And of course, we've seen a, an unleashing a torrent of emotion around uh, the injustices, around racism uh, and social injustice. And I know how, um, how much all of that means to you. And my question to you, Yo-Yo, uh, Yo -Yo, is how are you coping with all of this? I know you put out Songs of Comfort, which you know inspired so many listeners, but What's your inspiration these days? How are you coping through all of this? Well, I, I think not unlike what I've seen you uh, do with PayPal in in the immediate term and uh, to the long term, I've been thinking that um, in in my own metaphorical thinking, I'm thinking we just went through a blizzard, and during the blizzard. We have to come together and just survive, right? This is like all hands on deck. We need to do this. Now, in the midst of 
what we know is going to be an economic crisis. And, you know, there's a lot of debt. There's a lot of and and the the racial crisis that's that's coming to the fore. We obviously need to do things immediately, but we also know that systemic change is a very long term process. So that's why I was interested in how you think of long term. So I'm thinking that we get through the blizzard, but now we've actually gone through one trimester, four months of the year of yes. lockdown and coming out. And we're now facing a long winter. And this, so we're coming to terms of saying, oh my gosh, I thought this was go away after a couple of weeks. Uh uh-uh. This is going to last and last, and we don't have any answers. No, don't have any quick answers. We don't have any permanent, you know, uh, sure answers, but it's all, everything is qualified. So we have to be resilient during this long winter. But then we need to actually think about at, at, at in a way that we don't usually have to think about when we're really busy. You don't have time for that kind of long-term thinking. But ultimately, it's sort of like, well, what kind of world do we actually want to live in? And that's sort of long-term, what do you want to give to your grandchildren? Or as Native Americans, indigenous people think seven generations. You know, I'm thinking grandchildren, that's only three generations. So what? So how do we think in terms of those timelines? Because the projections for all kinds of things go into those, you know, decades and says, well, if we don't do this, 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 this is going to happen. So what do we do? And and so I think COVID has actually made me focus a lot on the long term partly because the short term being a privileged person i actually i'm grateful to have food in front of me you know that i actually and i'm relatively safe those are incredible privileges and i realize that and so if we're going to actually share those privileges what does that mean and um so beyond the songs of comfort of saying okay here's a song i hope it helps whatever i i also think about well what are we what what kind of education are we are we are we having? What does that happen? What happens to teachers that have to teach online, which for good teachers is so incredibly frustrating? And uh, how do we care about? Is the teaching is the education system adequate for the needs of our planetary world? Is that is 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 that a moment where educational institutions uh, both higher education as well as K through 12, as well as preschool. What are we, you know, are we teaching collaboration? Are we giving kids, young, very young people, the feeling of access and the sense of security enough so that they can be curious? So I'm thinking about that and saying, well, maybe I want to work in that sector because how do you build a 30 year arc for a very young person so that when they're 35, they're actually going to be involved in policy, in having great imaginative thinking, so they're able to collaborate in and learn quickly and be resilient in such a way that can deal with crises. So I'm thinking that way because partly because the moment itself right now is so painful that there's only, if I can actually spend less time whining and complaining and say, oh, you know, oh, this is so terrible. <laughs> it's right. like, you know, if only we could go back to before. Well, we know we can't. So I'd rather spin my wheels thinking, well, let's think constructive, long-term, midterm, so that we could backtrack to, okay, if that's the way I think long-term, then maybe the next five steps will be very clear. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, I think those are a bunch of really interesting points. Um, I think this has been a very painful time and a very reflective time to the point you are making. People are at home; they're not consumed by the everyday rat race um, that goes on all the time, and they have more time to think. And I think that. Um, Crises can do one of two things, I think, Yo-Yo. They can tear uh, society apart and they can tear apart the fabric 
of what holds us together and that can create despair, or they can bring us together. They can expose issues, as I mentioned before, have always been there, but nobody has had the time or the attention to look at them and then rally around what can we do today? And very importantly, how do we make sure this isn't a moment, but a movement towards something better? And, you know, what I I have the um, uh, advantage of seeing on our platform, the PayPal platform and the Venmo platform, what people do with their money, how they give, how they um, are supporting local businesses, people who need more than they do, who they don't even know and how they're giving to them, how they're supporting places of worship, um, schools. It, it is inspiring to see this outpouring of generosity um, that's happening. And so I have to say that I come out of this with the same sense of, you know, emotion that you have and uh, um, that everyone uh, watching us has, but a sense of determination that we should use everything that's happening to us at this point to make a difference going into the future. And you have a philosophy, and it's interesting to me because I think this is important. I'm curious what you think about this. And it started when you actually started first playing the cello. And I want to, I'm going to weave this into this. And you started a very difficult piece. I think it was cello suite number one, box cello suite number one, which is a very difficult piece. And what you said is it's less painful to learn something if you do it incrementally. And my view of that is sort of like, Let's not get overwhelmed by the big picture, but like, let's take steps one at a time. And by doing that, we can actually approach and possibly make a real difference in how we solve things. Can you talk a little bit about that and, you know, how you think about that philosophy, especially in today's world? I'd love to, because actually, I'm actually going to demonstrate it. And so this is a first (laughs) sweep. So now mm. for a four year old, you say, okay, well, this is this is beautiful. Well, this is the way it works. This is the first note. This is the second note. Three notes. Now the first eight notes in this piece are repeated. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. one, two, three, four. But it's only three notes. Mm. Uh, the next day, same notes except two are different. Mm-hmm. Now, so basically, Everything we have in life, in computers, in the digital world, it's about yes, no, yes, no, zero, one, zero, one. Is it the same note? No, it's not the same note. It's about pattern recognition. And out of patterns, and this is the same, this is not the same, we actually can construct all the information in the world, right? So, so interesting, yep. And so, and so in music, in humanity, in physics, they're first principles. Mm-hmm. And first principles, you know, for humanity, some people can say, do no harm or love thy neighbor. You know, it's like, or thou shalt not kill. Now, these are very simple things. But do we do that? Yeah. Right? Music sounds gorgeous, beautiful. It's constructed like our DNA from very simple things. And we build on those simple things. You know, we have a baby and the baby crawls. The first thing they do is 
they try and get out of your sight and then just to check to see when whether you <laughs> notice or not, right? Yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. And so it's the push-pull thing. This is home. We go away from home. We come back to home. How safe is it? I need to get away. I come back home. So that's, again, that's another kind of push-pull thing that we get with with the perception of patterns. Uh, is it safe? Is it not safe? A two-year-old has such great power because they can say no. Yeah, yeah. No, and, you know, the most powerful words my children ever said is like, I don't want to talk about it. Right, right. <laughs> what do you do when your child says, I don't want to talk about it, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, so these are, you know, so for things that we think are so complex, human nature is very complex. But it starts from the simplest and simplest of ideas. But it has, if you're going to think that idea, then are you? can you stick with it? Can you be consistent? So, for example, telling the truth. Now, that's very difficult because sometimes, well, you know, uh, did you do that? Uh, I don't know. But it's how, <laughs> how close to the truth can you get? In science, yeah. in human relations, trust. Do you trust everybody you meet? Why do you trust somebody? Why don't you trust somebody? Mm. Playing music is not about showing how much you know. It's about actually showing how much you care. And do you trust what I say about how much I care? Am I putting it on? Am I... And people are very smart. They know when somebody's telling the truth or not. They know and it's like, and we have to kind of be very careful. And everything that we do in society, everything in music depends on truth, trust, and service. I can't go on stage and play with fellow musicians if I don't trust them. Because if something happens, we pick up each other's notes. It's like playing a game, right? You're passing the ball. You're always, are you a team player? Are you solo playing? Are you going to keep the ball? Are you going to go? So it's like, show, look at me. I'm so great. Or look at us. We can do this. And, yeah. and that's the kind of thing that we're wrestling with all the time. Uh, and, and the more trust you can build, the more spectacular your building can be. Yeah. Yeah. It's also harder um, because doing something yourself, you control that. Working with others, you need to then start to work, uh, not individually, but collectively. And that's something that you are doing more and more of, whether it be with you know the World Economic Forum that you're a trustee, or you really... Uh, have embraced some very big goals like the UN sustainability uh, goals. These are things, you know, you often wear the pin when, when you're, uh, when you are, uh, yes, <laughs> there it is. That pin represents the different goals that the United Nations has uh, in terms of sustainability. Can you talk a little bit about why that's so important to you? And, you know, it's this idea of, working globally to address some very big and difficult issues and, you know, your role in that. You know, you know. Well, I, I would love to talk about it. And then I really do want to turn the question to you on uh, maybe you can spend some time telling us about how you've been able to develop this, uh, the, the funds and the different, uh, and the, and the different programs, uh, with dealing with Black Lives Matter. I mean, I think that's because the two go together. Uh, yep. Equity, racial equity, gender equity, and poverty, uh, good jobs. Uh, and you, what you just said, 75% of the people in the world are worried about their world, the, the fractures in our world. So actually, it's not my problem. It's not your problem. It's our problem. And, and I think, I think uh, for me, in music or in culture, uh, the strength of what 
uh, the power of what culture can do is that it can actually turn the other into us. Mm. So what is yours can become mine because music is so uh, portable. It's ephemeral. So if you like it, it's yours, right? You like a tune? Yeah, it's yours. You can go home you and remember. sing it, right? And so it crosses borders, <laughs> yes. yeah. it builds bridge bridges, and it does not build walls because as long as if you hear it, you own it. So, so if that were the case, you know, you like a food. Well, you can make go home and you can make it, right? You can get the recipe. So it's not. So there are no secrets in that way. So what we have and if we what we like is always shared and and so so that's for music now un sustainable development goals there none of these goals i don't know anybody that doesn't believe in you know supporting life under the ocean we want fish to keep swimming and we want to eat fish and we want to have our vegetables uh, without pesticides. You know, we don't want to be poisoned by chemicals. Yeah, absolutely. So, but how do we do it? And I think what sometimes prevents an individual like me to say, uh, these goals are important, I should support it because the first thing is the goal is too big, somebody else should do it and uh, and I'm just one person, I'm not powerful, so I'm just going to shut that down. I'm going to go back and do something that I do have an effect over. The problem is that actually none of these goals can be solved unless everybody participates. Yeah. There's no government that's powerful enough. There's no corporation that's powerful. There's no entity. The UN is not powerful enough to say, oh, we're going to do this. And No, nobody can do it unless we all do that. So the only reason I wear this is for the simple reason that I want people to look at it and say, what is it? <laughs> and say, you, right. you know, it's like, what is that little trinket that you're you're wearing? And to start a conversation. Hey, what is it you're wearing? You know? Oh, and most people, they don't know about it. Yeah. Occasionally someone recognizes it. Yeah. But yet it's something that I know in the privacy of our shower or in the bedroom, we think about it and then we dismiss it, right? Yeah. We all think about it. This is not, and, and, and what I love about what you say is that you get to see on PayPal what people spend their money on. And, and what I see when I go to local communities everywhere, every small town, every place that is away from, you know, big centers, people care. Yeah. They yeah. give, they they connect, they, you know, so the fractures that we see at certain high levels, yes, it can exist in local, but more often than not, no, because I can't have a fight with you because I see you every day. Our kids go to school together. We worship in the same church. We, you know, whatever it is, we're connecting all the time. So how can we build from those local entities of really generous people and 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 concerned citizens who care and they want a better life? They want to think three, five, seven generations if they can, but to build all the way to the supposed lar larger goals that that seem uh, not reachable for yeah. an individual. Does that make any sense? Sure, of course it does. Of course it does. I think it's the collective in which you have power, uh, real power to make change. Um, I think we're seeing that today. And, you know, I do really believe that a single individual can make a real difference. But the way they make a real difference is by rallying people behind a cause. It's you, one single person can make a difference in how so many feel and act. And I think, you know, it's incumbent, I think now upon leaders in the arts, leaders in the business community, leaders in the public sector to step up. Um, I, I, you asked about 
uh, PayPal and um, and what we're doing around um, the fight for racial equality um, to close the racial wealth gap. You know, my view is um, business leaders and companies have a moral obligation to stand for more than just making money, to have a purpose and to serve multiple constituencies. Like this, we can't go back to the 1950s and 60s where, you know, the sole goal of a company was to maximize profits for shareholders over the next quarter or two. Like, I think if you want to be, ever aspire to be a great company, you need a couple of things. One, you need to have, uh, number one, great employees inside the company. And great employees come to a company because they believe that if they come there, they can make a difference. And number two, that the values of that company are something that they believe in and they watch um, that company take principled stands around those values. To a point you were making, it's, it's not about words, it's about the actions that you take. If you just have words up on a wall, but you don't act on them, they're propaganda. You know, my dad always said to me that you are what you do, not what you say. And I think, you know, for PayPal, this idea of inclusion is such a powerful uh, driving force for us. And when I listened and I learned and I saw what was uh, being unleashed uh, with the killing of George Floyd and so many other senseless uh, deaths across the country, um, that I realized that um, it wasn't enough for PayPal to condemn racism and maybe give um, you know a million dollars to some nonprofits that are doing the fight every single day, but that we really had to be uh, in it for the medium and the long term uh, because. Um, we want there to be systemic change. And your point is that doesn't happen over the short term. There are needs over the short term, and you must address those needs. But then you have to be willing to be in the fight over the medium to the long term, which is why you know, we um, decided that we were going to put $530 million, it's a large amount of money, um, to really doing something that we felt we were able to, to help with, which was close the, the racial uh, wealth gap uh, that has been with us since the 1960s. It hasn't closed at all. And uh, that we would do that over, not just now, but over the medium and the long term as well, and be part of the fight and be part of doing the work day in and day out. And by the way, you know, the great thing about that is it inspires everybody inside PayPal as well. And I think and believe it inspires our customers uh, and our shareholders as well. And so uh, I think about this in, in a holistic way. And I think that we have responsibilities as leaders, you and me and others uh, that we talk to, to step up. Well, I, I so admire that. I see that at as you know, as I was reading through what you do, is that actually, you know, for individuals that actually volunteer, you actually provide funds, and for yep. for black businesses, you provide loans, and for people that actually want to give money, you match them two to one, or right. So, uh, so so you're actually it's it's yes, five hundred thirty million dollars, a huge amount of money, but actually there are all these steps that you are addressing yes. in in between that I think is really, really important. My question to you and my question to myself too is sort of like, how much support do you get from, do you get pushback? Do you get support from your shareholders? And do you get support from, uh, and and what's the pushback? Because I'm sure people will say, wait a minute, you're spending this money, but that's less money for me, right? You know, it's like, wait, this money could go to me and or, I could do this in in my little sector and say, well, you know, yo, he can do that because he, you know, well, because that's, but we can't because, you know, people are, have good reasons 
Mm -hmm. It's complicated. How do you negotiate that? Yeah, I think the way, at least from my perspective, Yo-Yo, I'd love to hear yours. I think this is, you make decisions based on values that you hold near and dear to yourself. And by the way, do you get pushback? Of course you get pushback. Like, yeah. the, not everybody agrees with every decision. You know, I've gotten, you know, multiple, multiple death threats as a result of stands that we've taken. And so it's not just pushback. I mean, there are real, you know, physical threats wow. that, as a result of that. But you, you, I think the question really is, do you live up to your principles and your values and does your company or, you know, what you stand for as an individual live up to that? And, yeah. and because that's who we are, that's who PayPal is. And I feel like if we, not everybody's going to agree, not every shareholder will agree, not every customer will agree, but at least they all know what our values are and that we're consistent in applying them. We try not to make political right. based decisions, mm -hmm. but values based decisions. And I think acting on those values has a cascading effect of attracting talent that also is passionate about those values. And when you have passionate talent around you, like you do in Silk Road or you do it like we do at PayPal, um, that's when beautiful things can happen. Um, and uh, and so I, I, I think profit and purpose actually work hand in hand together. They aren't at odds with each other. It's just a matter sometimes of the timing of that. But over the medium to long term, I actually think they go they go beautifully together. Mm -hmm. That's that's fantastic because I think you're also articulating something that is uh, part of the first principles of economics, that it's an outgrowth of moral philosophy. So you mentioned the word moral, which is actually, you know, you think that's antithetical to uh, to capitalism, to make it, but actually that's actually at the very basis, that's how it started because capitalism is a worthwhile enterprise if the moral part is is part of it, right? So it's like people said, you know, when as I was growing up in music, oh, artists, art for art's sake, you know, as if it could exist without any framing and mm -hmm. in the universe and it just has a life of its own. I, I, I kind of all, always was uncomfortable with that. And not that I thought that it should be tethered to things that, you know, it should have, there should be some form of life in a piece of music that lives in somebody but the the motivation behind it, the preconditions of what gave rise to it, is something that I think uh, is more like uh, art for life's sake mm -hmm. than art for art's sake. And art for life's sake means it's for us. Yeah. Right. And, and and I think that was something I, I always wrestled with. And because I grew up sort of in, you know, teachers would say, this is the way it is, and this is the way it is. And I felt kind of uncomfortable and also useless. You know, so, you know like, okay, well, what can I do about this? I can't I can't deal with all these incredibly huge problems around me. And I thought, well, this is for others to deal with, and I should just focus on my little corner and you know trying to get good and yeah you know, and 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 then maybe I'll have a job. Well, as I got better or got recognized, I kept asking these questions and realized that that in fact uh, I'm there to to define my purpose because the world does not need another cellist. Mm -hmm. So if I'm to actually have a job as a cellist, you know, I'm not a fireman. You know, it's like we need a fireman, we need a doctor. But if I'm to actually be a valued person practicing something that I think I love and and that I'd like to do more of, 
that I need to find its value in the places that I go to. And I have to make sure that it's not the places where that, you know, that people can pay, uh, you know, good prices to give me the privileges of life. But who am I serving? I guess that's the question. Who am I actually serving? And 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 those are the questions that I started asking. And and as you ask them, and and sometimes I find some answers. And and I think that's how the growth process evolved over over decades. Yeah. You know, you know, as I think about you, you know, the thing I think that's defined you in the world's view obviously comes from music. But to your point, if that's all you had done, then you really wouldn't be who you are today. What, what's happened is you've been able to take that and advocate for so many things. And oftentimes, as we talked about, that's very difficult uh, to go and do. Um, it's not not everything is universally accepted one way or another. In fact, very few things uh, are. You know, one of the things that I always ask, and this is always my ending question in, a, in an interview, which is even people who have had great degrees of success have, have suffered at some point in their life. It could be in their personal life, in their professional life, where they've been hit really hard. And they've been knocked down, and it's been difficult for them to get back up. Is there an example, Yo-Yo, that you could share with people who are watching this today? That and and how you dealt with that, and and obviously got back up on your feet, because all of us are trying to figure that out constantly. Yeah. Well, especially now, I think uh, yeah. where. This getting back on our feet and resilience and 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 motivation, daily motivation. You get up and says, "Okay, what is this for?" You know, and should I go back to bed? You, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. not you, but you know, the yeah. rest of us. It's like, yeah. you know, I can't deal with it. <laughs> Pull the covers over my head, and, <laughs> and I, I think that um, that's one thing that I've learned. I actually had a talk with a fellow uh, musician, uh, Kathy Stott, who's a wonderful pianist. I play with her a lot. And she lives in England. And, and we're talking about this kind of resilience. I said, you know, actually, one of the things that as performers, and you as a practitioner of this fantastic martial art that you, 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 that's, you actually, you cannot perform unless you're motivated. Mm -hmm. So, and each day, you can't use yesterday's motivation for today's performance. It's got to be somehow you got to grab it and create it and do it and absolutely be a thousand percent focused. So there's that immediate thing that that's that's propelling me. I had scoliosis when I was I was diagnosed with a very severe curvature of the spine when I was a teenager and. Uh, my future wife was the first person who identified it. I was 19. She took me to the, the health services and the doctor said, well, this is terrible. You know, it's like, you know, if it keeps going at, by the time you're 25, you're like inoperable and mm. you will, you know, it'll mess up your organs and you'll die. Well, that's, that was interesting. You know, you get diagnosed with something. You're faced with an operation and um, a curve that was like 55 and 45 degrees. So you know, think of an S. Yeah. So my spine was not straight. It was like an S curve. And so we were told that, you know, if by, by the age of 25, you don't get the operation, your bones start to harden and then you can't really fix it. So um, uh, I had six years and, you know, to play with, to say, okay, well, I'll played the cello and go and do stuff. Uh, and and I was at peace by the time of the operation. I think I was 28 or something. Uh, uh, and, and I thought to myself, 
well, I've done these wonderful things in music. I have led a life of the kind of privilege where I did go to a liberal arts college, which meant that liberal arts is supposed to give you resilience in terms of being able to shift gears. If you don't, can't do this, you could do something else. So I thought to myself, look, if I can't play anymore, I'll do something else. And that was actually an incredible liberation, right? Because once I survived the operation, I was in a cast for six months, and this was like, okay, you were just given a gift of another life. And so I think moments like that can help uh, that you could go back to a lot of people in the military who've seen action and whatever, if they've survived the action, they've survived PTSD, they, you can look at them and they say, well, you know, what are you going to do to me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I've been through this and basically this is part of me. <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. What are you going to do to me? And and sort of that's, that's kind of the attitude uh, that can deal with the unknown, uh, the 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 insecurity of judgment of peers of others says you're not worth it you're nothing okay so i'm nothing fine you know it's like it, yeah. it, it you, you just have it get, you're, it's 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 a teflon coating you know insult me tell me i'm nothing whatever i'll take it because actually i know i'm not worth very much but if I think about it, I can do a, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and I can actually pick up the pieces and if things are destroyed and I can try and start again. And so, so I think the worst thing that I can do is to try and build a wall in order to protect myself from the new. Mm. Because if I do that, that's that's the beginning of you know um, what's what's uh, the Scrooge story, right? Yeah. Scrooge builds up the wall, said, "Bah humbug! I'm not going to let in the world. I'm just going to do this, and because I don't care." And of course, you know, he lives, but is not very yeah. happy. And it's only when he opens his windows and his doors, then he is a participant in a wonderful life. And I think that's that's ultimately, we have to figure out where are our windows and where are our doors? When do we shut them for protection? When do we open them again? And the trick is to try and keep your windows open as much as possible. Yeah, you, you, that is probably one of the nicest metaphors and uh, i think absolutely right on um as well because that is not always easy to do first of all it's not easy to accept that sometimes you are going to you may have to change based on circumstances that were no choice of your own yeah. um but then also opening up uh to that and letting others in to help uh in in uh in whatever uh has happened to you either in Good times or bad times, I think, is essential for moving forward and uh, and embracing life. Um, and you know, I just want to thank you uh, for the time. Um, it's always so great to see you, and uh, it's such a pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you again in person sooner than later. Same here. And and Dan, I I treasure the fact that I know you and that know your fabulous family you have great children and and yeah. so, so incredible singer in the family so talented oh my gosh and you know and, and the way you're with your family makes me trust what you do at, in as the head of a company because i see the values at play constantly and that's important Thank you so much, Yo-Yo. And thank you. And have a great rest of the day, Yo-Yo. And uh, we'll you. talk soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye, Dad.